Hello, AP Stats. Hope you guys are doing fantabulous. Um, okay, today we're still doing binomial distributions. Yay! Part two ish, point five ish. I don't know. Whatever. Um, third day of binomial distributions, but you know, officially part two. Anyways. Um, we're going to be looking at what the expected value is of a binomial random variable, um, or the mean, same thing, and standard deviation, how to calculate those, how to interpret them, and also then um, how to look at a, a normal approximation of a binomial distribution. Okay, um, so it's gonna, we're going to be using it when we're sampling. Okay, so... Expected value. So these formulas are on your formula sheet, so make sure you find them, know where they are, um, so you don't need to memorize them. But anyways, expected value, or the same thing as the mean of a binomial random variable, with n trials, and p is your probability of success, um, is n times p. Standard deviation is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, and I will write that down for you. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because, like, for the expected value, um, the expected value is the number of trials times the probability of getting a success. So, say, um, the probability of flipping heads on a, a fair flip of a coin um, is 0.5, right? And if I have 10 flips of the coin, so 10 trials, I would expect 10 times 0.5 or 5 heads to come up. So there you go. Makes sense. Uh, in, if you're curious about the standard deviation, where that comes from, there's a proof in the book on page 391. Um, and if you're curious about where that comes from, great. You can go take a look at it. But um, more importantly, you're going to need to be able to use it and interpret it and uh, use it in appropriate situations. Um, as far as our conditions, uh, this next section here, um, I'm not going to go over that until we get to the normal approximation of the binomial distribution. So let's try our first example. We've got Mrs. Pravilat creating a quiz to teach students about probability. Quiz has 10 questions. Um, students have to random, and she, you know, she randomly selects the answers using a random number generator. Students have to guess. Uh, a through E, so there's five options, A, B, C, D, E, five options. Um, they just have to guess an answer. They have to get more than five problems correct to pass the quiz. So um, we're going to define the random variable X to be the number of correct problems a student gets on the quiz. Um, so question number one, is X a binomial distribution? Think about your conditions. All right, is the event binary? Okay, yes or no, win or lose, right or wrong. There's no other options, and yes, they either get the problem correct or they get the problem incorrect. So yes, it's binary. Question number two, are the events independent? Right, are each try sorry, is each trial independent of the previous trial? Yes, right? Um, the probability of somebody guessing a problem correct on problem number five is not dependent on whether or not they got problem four correct, okay? Because everything is random. So yes, we have independence. N uh, is the number of trials fixed. Um, each individual question is a trial of the event. Um, and so, yes, there's a set number of problems. There's 10 problems, which means um, our number of trials, n, little n, is 10. Yes. And then s is probability of success has to be the same for each trial. And it is. Probability of success is uh, 1 out of 5, 20.2, um, because there's five problems on each. Uh, on each question. So it is, in fact, a binomial distribution. Yay! Okay, so next question. What's the probability that x is greater than 5? And what does this re represent in context? Um, so x is the number of correct problems a student gets on the quiz. And students must get more than 5 
correct to pass. So um, the probability that x is greater than 5 is the probability of a particular student um, getting more than 5 problems correct. So the probability of a student passing. All right, so finding this probability, um, if, you, if you're struggling with how, how I'm finding this probability, um, go to the last video, 3 point or 6.3.11 um, and it'll, it'll show you kind of this process again um, but I'm just going to use binom CDF in the calculator to calculate this so I'm going to go second bars binom CDF I have 10 trials my probability of success is 0.2 and I want less than or equal to 5 so I'm going to go 5 there paste and then I want 1 minus that answer. Okay, and again, if you're not sure where this is coming from, go uh, review the last video. Um, so the probability that x is greater than 5 is 0 0.006369. Um, and that's the probability of a given person passing this random test. All right, since it is a binomial, binomial random variable, um, we have the formulas for the mean, or the expected value, and the standard deviation. Um, so our mean is n times p, which is uh, the number of trials, 10, times the probability of success is 0.2, which is 2. Um, and then my standard deviation is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. So that's the square root of uh, 10 times 0.2 times 0.8 and uh, so you get your sigma to be 1.265 approximately and basically right um, this mean or expected value of 2 is um, any given student is expected to get two answers right on the quiz and uh, the standard deviation basically means that we'd expect any given individual to um, their, their individual score to vary from the mean by approximately 1.265 correct answers. So I'll write that down for you. All right, so that would be number three. Um, number four says that if we have a class of size 30, what's the expected number of students that would pass? So this is actually a different distribution um, because our probability of success is not 0.2 probability of success is the probability of passing which we figured out is 0 0.0064 so we actually have a new binomial distribution um, because again binary they either pass or they don't independent one student's passing or failing is independent of another's um, number of trials n is 30 and uh, probability of success is um, 0 0.0064 which we got from number two. So I'm just going to define y to be um, a new random variable, uh, which is this number of students that pass n number of trials is 30, probability of success is 0 0.0064, and we want to know the mean of y, which is number of trials times the probability of success, and in this case our number of trials is 30, probability is 0 0.0064, and you can get your expected value that way which is 0.192. So out of 30 students, we'd expect 0.192 students to pass, which is, you can round to zero. So we would expect um, nobody to pass, which is a bummer. All right, so now we're getting into the normal approximation for the binomial distribution. Um, and we'll start with an example. So um, you have a chip distributor, like a uh, Lay's or something. Um, and they inspect a simple random sample of 100 chips from every load of a million chips. So imagine um, lots of chips. Okay, suppose, unknown to the company, 10% of the chips in the shipment are burnt. Count the number x of bad chips in the sample. Question number one, is this a binomial setting? Why or why not? All right, one, is it binary? Okay, yes, because the chip is either burnt or it's not. Um, independent? That is a good question because so the probability of one chip being burnt, right, so say like we have um, we, we take out a chip and we see 
is this burnt or not? And it is not burnt. Um, and we take it out and we sample the next chip, right? Because we don't want to sample the same thing twice. So typically you sample without replacement. So a sample, oh, it's not burnt, okay, great. Well, that means the next chip that I pick, the probability of it being burnt has changed, okay? So technically speaking, not independent. Now let's check the other ones just in case. Okay, um, N is, is the number of trials um, uh, set. Yeah, and we're, we're taking out 100 chips. Yes, so that is good. N is 100. And then S is the probability of success. And we'll call finding a burnt chip a success. Okay, so those things are, we, we can check those off, but the independent thing is um, an issue. So if you look at the, the actual probability of the chip situation, right? Say we want to know, like, what's the probability of getting absolutely no burnt chips in the sample? Well, the probability of the first chip being not burnt is uh, 90,000 out of... 900,000 out of a million um, because 10% of the actual population are, are burnt, which means 90% are not. So the probability of the first chip being not burnt is 900,000 out of a million. And now since I've removed one good chip, that means the probability of my second chip being good is 800,900. 899,999 out of 999. I mean, it's like totally ridiculous. Um, and then you do this 100, 100 times, right? Because you're sampling 100 chips. So this would take forever. And if you compare it to the binomial distribution and assuming that the independence case is like not as big of a deal as, you know, we were making it out to be, you find that the probabilities are, are quite similar. So kind of as a general rule of thumb, um, as long as my sample size is not larger than 10% of the population, I basically have not made that big of an impact on the probability of sampling without replacement that I can just use um, a binomial distribution instead, which means I can kind of assume this independence case um, that even though sampling without replacement isn't, those aren't independent trials, um, it'll be close enough to the true answer that it doesn't matter, and so we can use the approximation instead. So I'm going to go back up to the notes here and say, to check for independence, right, my sample size has to be less than or equal to 10% um, of the population, so 0 0.1 times big N, where little n is the sample size and big N is the size of the population. All right, lastly, if we want to calculate probabilities using a binomial distribution um, and random sampling, um, you you, the larger your sample size is and the closer your, so the larger little n is, um, and the closer p is to 0.5, um, the closer your binomial distribution will be to a normal curve. And it will have a mean of um, your uh, expected value, n times p, and your standard deviation will be approximately square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Um, and so in order to use the normal distribution, you must check that, that your sample size is large enough. Um, so n times p has to be greater than or equal to 10, and n times 1 minus p also has to be greater than or equal to 10. So basically your expected number of successes and your expected number of failures ha both have to be larger than 10, larger than or equal to 10 in order for you to use the normal distribution as an approximation of the binomial distribution. So in general, if you have um, x being the, having a, prob a binomial distribution with n trials and probability of success p, when n is large enough, so n times p is greater than 10, and n times 1 minus p is greater than 10, the distribution of x is approximately normal, with the mean being the expected value of x, and a uh, standard deviation of square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Um, and so the last example here. Um, Alright, so let's try this one last example. So 
Sample surveys show that fewer people enjoy shopping than in the past. A survey asked a nationwide sample of 2,500 adults if they agreed or disagreed um, that I like buying new clothes, but shopping is often frustrating and time consuming. The population that the poll wants to draw conclusions. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I suppose 60% of the residents would say agree if asked the same question. So this is talking about the population. Um, so the true population proportion of agreeing is 60%. X is the number in the sample who agree. Um, and so uh, there are approximately 235 million people in the U.S. Okay, so um, A asks to show that X is approximately a binomial random variable. Um, so you want to check bins and you'll get to the independent part and you'll realize, oh yeah, it's sampling without replacement which is not independent and so you have to have that 10% rule right you're you're you can't have a sample that's larger than 10% of your population so that's what you need to check and you do actually have to calculate it you can't just check it off right so binary yep cuz they get agree or disagree um i independent no but it's close enough since n is our sample size 2500 is less than or equal to 10% of 235 million um, and then you can calculate that just to, you know, prove that it is. Um, I prefer to say something like um, there are more than 25,000 people in the United States. Uh, number of trials is fixed, right? That's your sample. So our n, little n, our, our uh, number of trials or sample size um, is that 25 hundred people and then s is the probability of success so your probability of success is 0.6 uh, b asks you to check conditions for normal approximation um, and so you just want to check that n times p and n times 1 minus p um, are both greater than or equal to 10 Okay, and you actually have to calculate those out. So n is 2,500, p is 0.6, 1 minus p is 0.4. So check both of those. So n times p is 1,500, and n times 1 minus p is 1,000. Both of those are greater than 10. So we're good. Um, and then c says, all right, if b is satisfied, right, that tells us that we can use the normal approximation. Um, we can estimate, we want to estimate the probability that um, 1,520 out of the 2,500 or more of the sample agree. Um, and if we didn't do the approximation and the, the normal approximation where we can use like the normal curve and use normal CDF and all that fun stuff, um, and we didn't assume this, this independent clause here, um, we would be multiplying out um, that many values times each other and it would be a disaster. So this is way easier, um, way more cost effective. So anyways, um, since we satisfied B and A, um, now we can make our approximate normal distribution. Um, the mean is going to be the expected value, which is n times p, which I already calculated up here, 1500. And my standard deviation is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. So I get sigma to be about 24.5. And I want 1520, so wherever that is, here's 1520. And I want 1520 or more of the sample agreeing. So I'm looking for the area of that. So I want to find my z-score, use normal CDF, or use your table, you know, the way we always calculate values under a normal curve. Hey! So I get my z-score, uh, which is about 0.8163, um, and then so I want to find the probability that z is larger than that, right, which is the same thing as the probability that x is greater than 1520. And then you can use your table or normal CDF, and you should get the following. Approximately 0.207 or 0.206, depending on what you rounded to and whether or not you use the table or you use normal CDF, but close to that. Okay? It's an approximation. Everything here is an approximation, so just so you know. Alright, good deal.
Bye-bye.